Starting in the late 19th century, international Morse code became the backbone of long distance communications around the globe. Perhaps the most famous Morse code message was the distress call sent by the floundering Titanic in 1912. Come at once, we have struck an iceberg and we are sinking. By the time of World War II, Morse code was well established as the primary mode for long distance communications at sea. When America entered the war after Pearl Harbor, young men from across the country heard the call and volunteered for all the services, including the Merchant Marines. I think uh, I was at home listening to the radio. This was pre-television days. And they broke in with uh, an announcement that we had been attacked. And I was in high school at the time, and I thought, boy, I've got to get into this. And so I did. The United States mobilized its manufacturing resources to provide ships for supplying war materials to our allies, Great Britain and the Soviet Union. These Liberty ships and Victory ships were manned by merchant seamen and a naval armed guard, and they carried all types of war supplies throughout the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. I went to Newton High School in Massachusetts, suburb of Boston, and the war started and they opened up the trade school after the regular school hours to the high school students, and I'd always been interested for some reason in radio. And I was in Boy Scouts, and one of the scoutmasters was a ham radio operator. And he showed me his station one day and sent some Morse code. And that just fascinated me, and I knew I, I just have to do that. So, and that's what I wanted. And there was a radio program on uh, urging uh, volunteers for the Merchant Marine. And they needed radio operators, and I thought that's for me. And so upon graduation from high school, I tried to join the Navy and could not pass the physical because of a, a hearing loss uh, from something in childhood. And, but the maritime service wasn't quite as fussy. And they almost guaranteed me uh, a chance at radio school. And so I joined the maritime service. And that's how I got into it. A new generation of young mariners was trained at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, various state maritime academies, or a U.S. Maritime Service training station, like the one at Hoffman Island, New York. Hoffman Island was a man-made island in uh, New York Harbor. And at one time, it was uh, used to um, examine immigrants from the various countries during the, the waves of immigration. And I think it also acted as some kind of uh, um, isolation station in case someone bore a disease or something like that. And then uh, when those waves of immigration stopped, I guess the island was just abandoned. Uh, I do understand the Coast Guard took it over for a while as some kind of a training base. And then uh, during World War II, there was a need for uh, radio officers and others in the Merchant Marine. And so Hoffman Island became a radio school uh, of the Maritime Service to train men uh, to be radio officers in the Merchant Marine. Getting into Morse code, uh, as a Boy Scout, I had been introduced to it, but uh, I had no idea that I'd make a career out of it. Now, when the when I graduated from high school at uh, 16 and a half, I was too young to get in any of the services, or most of us felt at that time that you had to get out there and where the action was. So I heard that they were uh, hiring men at 16 and a half in what they called the Merchant Marine, or Maritime Service. I had no idea what it was. 
Well, I got in, I uh, went through a boot camp, similar to Navy boot camp over at uh, St. Petersburg. And then after completion of that, for some reason, I don't know why they gave me an aptitude test for Morse code. And I must have passed because <laughs> four of us each week were sent from St. Petersburg up to Hoffman Island uh, uh, radio uh, training station. And uh, that's where the Morse code really began. <laughs> I had already, there, was, there were several things they taught you at that school. I was typing and uh, of course Morse code was the biggie, uh, radio electronics, and then towards the end was the, uh, the ciphering and the actual uh, shooting down airplanes and all that fun stuff. Uh, so uh, they had condensed that course from a two-year course down to, down to uh, five months. So it was, it, was, it was pretty tough there. I had it beat by already being able to type. Uh, I could concentrate more on the Morse code, and that that consisted of a room full of of keys like this, all in a line, and somebody behind each one, and the instructor up in front of you. What he would send the code, and you were expected to copy it, and you could. Then he would. It seems to me like we had a call sign or a station each of us, and then he could call with Morse code that your station and you better be able to answer that question. But this, as, as you got into it, oh, it must have been five hours a day of code practice. And uh, it, I saw several of the kids, and they were kids, just rip off their headphones and jam their pencil down into the desk and walk out never to return. So it, it, was, it was tough, but that was my introduction to Morse code. The daily routine was, uh, I thought, rather severe. Uh, an awfully loud buzzer was sounded at uh, 6 a.m. and everybody was up and at them. And uh, we did our uh, toiletry preparations, then made our bunks, then marched to chow breakfast and following that there was some kind of inspection and then we started the class day uh, which went all day long uh, with breaks of course for uh, lunch and ended uh, sometime in the late afternoon and as I remember it we had three hours of code, Morse code per day and then an equal time with radio theory and the day was all filled up uh, at the end of each week, there was an examination on the week's material. And if one did not make a certain grade, then one was, quote, invited to spend the weekend at makeup school and lost the leave privileges. I think I put in two of those. <laughs> well, you, you lived in the barracks, and which was kept spotlessly clean, military fashion. Uh, you would arise fairly early, and uh, I don't recall marching to class, but we, uh, they had the military music sounding all the time, going uh, where you couldn't get away from it. And you would go to the whatever class you were going to. Like I say, it was uh, more, mainly it was Morse code, radio electronic theor theory, and uh, and typing, things like that. But the things at the school that were most difficult for me were the theory, really. I didn't understand it. The Morse code came fairly easily. The typing I had covered, but the, uh, the theory, it just never really uh, made sense to me. <laughs> when, when they f showed us our first actual capacitor in, a, in a, a radio receiver or transmitter, I thought it would look like this, the diagram. That's the, you know, the diagrams all told me that, that this was a capacitor and this was a resistor. I didn't expect them to look like that. 
No, I never, I, w I never really shone on uh, in the theory end of it, but got it well enough to pass the test with the FCC and still have it. We were trained, well, first of all, in, in a code class. We had uh, typewriters with uh, the communications keyboard. That is, the keyboard is all capital letters plus the numbers and punctuation. Uh, secondly, on uh, the practical end of things, we had uh, a ship's uh, radio room set up with two different kinds of equipment, uh, one made by Radio Marine Corporation, the other made by uh, McKay Radio. And we trained on both of those. They were con uh, connected to dummy antennas. You couldn't go on the air during the war, even for training purposes. Uh, so uh, there was a huge, I think it was a 750 watt light bulb, uh, was the dummy antenna. And we would tune it up uh, to the brightest uh, brilliance of the, of the bulb, and then you knew the transmitter was on the air. We didn't have time to uh, concentrate on anything else except on weekends, when if we had performed well during the week, we were allowed away from the island and uh, over into, on our own in New York City at age 17, where everything was practically free if you were in uniform. Uh, subways were, I remember it cost, we had to save out about a dollar to get back to the island from Times Square. Uh, and that would, that would uh, serve as transportation. We were able to go into Radio City Music Hall uh, for maybe 50 cents or so. So it was, uh, that was, that was our extracurricular uh, action, was uh, mostly trying to get to uh, downtown New York City and back to the island uh, Monday morning. <laughs> At radio school, there was no additional training in weaponry or anything like that. However, what we call boot camp, uh, Sheep's Head Bay, uh, we did have some gunnery instruction. Uh, with an electronic, uh, some kind of an electronic machine gun and uh, with the projection to a screen of various airplanes and we would try to hit them with a moving dot which represented the bullets. Uh, the really emphasis on the training in the maritime service at boot camp, Sheep's Head Bay, was on lifeboat training. And we had something like, oh, I don't know, three or four hours a day of lifeboat training, which is really crucial. And in the end, uh, one took a test, uh, a Coast Guard test, and then on your seaman's papers, uh, it would say lifeboatman if you qualified uh, through the test. I felt I was well trained at Hoffman Island in the Maritime Service. And I passed the FCC license the first time around, the second class radio telegraph license, which later when I was 21, I upgraded to a first class license, which I, I still hold. And I will never let that expire because I probably could never pass the test again. <laughs> Many of these new radio officers were assigned to Liberty ships, carrying war materials to Europe. Oh, my first ship, that was, that was a classic Liberty ship. Uh, quite an adventure. Went on board the ship in New Orleans and uh, found her to be fully loaded uh, with uh, war supplies for Italy. Well, we didn't know where we were going, but fully supplied. And we looked around a little bit and thought it was rather strange cargo because uh, the cargo holds were all completely filled with, with one cargo, bottled beer. The, uh, the tween deck areas, which covered quite a lot of the, uh, of the Liberty ship, they had built stalls and we had 18 U.S. Army men come on board to care for the Missouri mules, which were, we finally found out, were going to Italy for the mountain warfare. They could, uh, they could 
use the mules as backpacks to places where the jeeps and other vehicles could not go. Oh my, my first ship was a Liberty ship, the SS John L. Sullivan. I think the call sign, if I remember correctly, and I might not, I think the call sign was KSOD. Uh, Kilo Sierra Obo Dog, or Delta is the new code, KSOD. It was a Liberty ship, and I was assigned as first assistant radio officer. Uh, and we sailed out of Baltimore uh, in a convoy, and the convoy grew larger and larger as we went north and then headed east. And the ultimate destination was Cherbourg, France, with the load of uh, war materiel. Now, France had been uh, heavily damaged, and there was really not much in Cherbourg to see or do. Uh, some of the shops had reopened. Uh, there were some goods available. I, I bought my mother some French perfume. I remember that. Uh, the other ports I went to after that, uh, my next voyage uh, took me to India. The Germans had surrendered, but Japan had not. We took war material uh, to Karachi, which was then India. It's now Pakistan, uh, West Pakistan, and around to Calcutta. And we sailed from there down to Ceylon, which is now called Sri Lanka, to Colombo. And the word was we were going to outfit for the invasion of Japan. We were a little bit nervous about that, but OK. Uh, and I knew the war couldn't be won without me. <laughs> In most, one of the most interesting ports that, that I visited was not even a port. It was a little village beach on the north coast of New Guinea. And the ship was loaded with uh, aviation gasoline in drums uh, that was destined for a little Australian uh, fighter uh, base up on the, in the highlands of New Guinea. And as we went into that little port, no facilities whatsoever. We dropped the anchor. And there's a full moon there in the South Pacific. It's about that big around. And uh, everything was bright as day, and the the uh, aroma of the flowers and everything from from this uh, little little village on New Guinea, Biak was the name of it, and it came out to us. And boy, we thought, is this heaven, or are we still in the South Pacific? But the little the little village was uh, well cared for little coral uh, rocks along the edge of their pathways. There was one shortcoming. There were no women. They had, uh, they had wisely removed all their women from, from the town out to some other island. Uh, whether that was uh, because of us or because of the Japanese, I'm not sure, but it probably worked both ways. Visits to exotic ports made these wartime voyages memorable. But most of a seaman's time was spent on the daily routines aboard ship. Uh, the main thing was to stand a watch. And as you know, on most ships, the watch is four hours on, eight hours off. Uh, however, the radio officers stood uh, different kinds of hours. The first ship I was on were just two of us, and so we stood uh, split schedules so as to copy what was known as BAMs, broadcast to Allied merchant ships, which uh, was sent by Navy Radio Washington, NSS, until you were halfway across the Atlantic, and then you switched to Rugby Radio, GBS, in Rugby, England. And you had to make sure you copied all of the BAMS things because sailing orders and diversions and things like that were included uh, in the messages. Uh, and we listened on 500 kilohertz. We called them kilocycles back then. 500 kilohertz, which was the international calling and distress frequency. During the wartime, I, uh, you're 
usually had three operators on board, so you would stand a, a four hour on, eight hour off watch, uh, and your first responsibility was to be sure that you did not miss a message. Uh, and you, because we operated under radio silence, and the only way that you could receive your message was to copy all these traffic lists from the Navy stations. And uh, if your ship came up on the on his traffic list, then you had better be be ready to copy that message. They would they would send it during two uh, two different schedules, probably four hours apart. But you had to get that, and it would usually come over in ciphers, groups of of uh, five numbers, uh, which we had learned how to decipher, and. Uh, the uh, on board, we we also had a Navy gun crew, the armed guard, and the Navy lieutenant was really in, supposed to do all that stuff, but he had his hands full, so he would generally have the radio officer go ahead and uh, do the ciphering and deciphering. Now, that was that was basically it: copying, receiving, most all almost entirely receiving, no no transmitting, no. And, and standing your eight-hour watch and copying weather broadcasts and stuff like that. We left Baltimore, and when we got out in the ocean, we were maybe surrounded by, say, six ships. And as we sailed north and east, ships came out of New York, then out of Boston, and then out of somewhere in Canada. And one morning, you wake up, and as far as you can see, there are ships and it's quite a sight and the ships are all in lines or rows and each one has a number each row has a uh, a letter if i remember correctly and each ship a number and you maintain those positions in the convoy uh, way out ahead of the convoy which uh, we never did see were navy ships uh, searching for submarines of course and i understand aft of the convoy and on both sides uh, it was rare that we ever saw those. Uh, one of the lead ships would be the convoy commodore who uh, commanded the entire convoy and told everybody to make a starboard turn or a port turn or steam straight ahead or slow down, speed up, whatever. Uh, I saw my first real convoy. We formed convoy up in uh, at Hampton Roads just off Norfolk. and. After convoy conference and all that stuff, why we finally sailed, and before we knew it, why we were surrounded by probably a hundred ships, mostly Liberty ships, because the the convoy would be formed according to the speed of the slowest ship. So that meant we were set for uh, to go across the Atlantic at about nine knots, which would be. 10, 11 miles per hour. Zigzagging, full convoy operations there, ships as far as you could see. And uh, when you got to Gibraltar, they would disband, they would break up the convoy because it made too good, too big of a cart of a target in, um, in the Mediterranean. We finally found out that we were going to Italy. And then from, from Gibraltar, Everybody was on his own to scoot, if a Liberty ship can scoot, scoot ac across the Mediterranean and up to Italy, where we uh, uh, discharged our, our mules at a little port of Rome, Civitavecca, and then went on up uh, to uh, Leghorn or Livorno and uh, discharged the bottled beer. And during, during that time, why, the war was coming to an end, but we could we could hear the uh, uh, the front lines send messages back and forth by cannon uh, at, at that time. I sent one SOS. Uh, it was in the Baltic Sea. Uh, we were on the way back uh, from Poland uh, after a voyage over there immediately after the war, and so therefore it was officially an SOS and not a SSSS like we had during the war, but the ship had uh, 
had hit something on the ground coming across the, the area was full of sunken ships and everything and so we thought that the the uh, ship her whole bottom was ripped out of course but the captain came running in and spark sparks here's the position send an SOS okay <laughs> no further explanation so I did that and uh, uh, pretty soon it appeared that we were not sinking and uh, so we uh, we made it on into uh, the Keel Canal there on on the way back, and uh, and evidently we had just scraped over a, a sunken ship or something. The place was the area was full of mines anyway, and everybody was still nervous. But uh, that was the uh, the only SOS I ever sent. Uh, during the war, there were I I heard several of the in the Atlantic the uh, SSS. Uh, for us messages and there's nothing you could really do about it except pass the message on because at that time you weren't the ship was not encouraged to go to the aid of the guy that was sending the message because that would set yourself up as a secondary target so yeah you could the, the range was was pretty long on 500 kilocycles there especially at night and uh, you could you could hear it for a thousand miles. The one incident I remember probably stands out in my mind uh, at sea was, as usual, it would entail storms, violent storms at sea. This one we had come out of uh, the English Channel, heading for the Gulf of Mexico, and we were in the Bay of Biscay, and uh, we hit a very, very strong uh, storm, more than gale force, and the seas were fantastic. Um, and as has been shown later, there is such a thing as a rogue wave, and we all agreed that one had hit us. And in your, when you're in seas like that, you don't go into the wave because when you would go over the wave, it would you would leave about half the ship out, and down she would come and thunkety thunkety thunk. So you tried to go across the wave like that, kind of climb over it and coast down. Well, we did some pretty heavy pounding, and before the you know, storm seas really subsided. She cracked in just forward of the house. This was a, a C2 uh, merchant ship. And she cracked pretty well down into the hull. And the engineers got out their tools and went up there and drilled at the base of that crack. The deck department got together and they, they ran uh, heavy, heavy cables and lines from the bow to the stern and, and pulled them up with the, with the winches and kind of kept her from coming apart. And uh, we limped on down to uh, the Azores and hid behind an island until the storm subsided. And then everybody decided, well, let's go on home. <laughs> So we lived into New Orleans in that fashion, and they fixed her up, and she was good as new. Seasick never, never touched me. I don't know why, really. I remember my first trip, uh, and it was, uh, uh, it was. We had as bad a weather as you could, you could, uh, as I have seen lately, uh, seen later, I should say. And uh, no, seasickness never did bother me. I used to just kind of laugh at. <laughs> those people who were turning green. And I, I, I know what seasickness is because I've seen them. They would rather be dead. Okay, well, the food on the ship in almost every case was good. You had the officers and, and the officers and the crew ate the same food, but we were served a little differently. And uh, you always had a menu of uh, three choices of entrees. You had vegetables, you had everything that, that you could want. The quality of the preparation varied from time to time. But uh, if, <laughs> that's being nice. <laughs> but uh, the food, the food was always good unless you ran out. And uh, I was on one ship that was out in the Pacific for a year, one trip. 
and we ran out of food several times and we would uh, scrounge uh, uh, food from the from the navy or or whoever or wherever we could get it and i remember one time all we had for about a month was spam and i've eaten spam in every way that you possibly can imagine it to be eaten and even thrown some over the side but uh, Generally speaking, the food and then the <laughs> adventure in the dining hall or the saloon, as we called it, uh, was very good. I think uh, probably my most my most favorite ship was uh, a Delta Line ship out of uh, New Orleans. That uh, she was a combination passenger cargo ship. She carried about a hundred passengers and and a full load of uh, of coffee beans. So she was on the. Uh, permanent run between Houston and New Orleans and we'd go down uh, through the Caribbean, uh, stop off at uh, Barbados on the way down and then on down to the Brazilian ports, uh, Rio and Santos and then on down to Montevideo and uh, Buenos Aires and then turn around and come back up, more or less the same trip, except we stopped off at uh, Curacao on the way north in Venezuela. So always with a full load of these green coffee beans and uh, uh, 100 or so uh, usually very old passengers. And uh, that's another story. But anyway, that, that was one of the favorite runs and ships I was on. She was air conditioned and had three radio officers and uh, really uh, that, that, that would have been my, my most favorite ship. There was one Norwegian second mate that was a real good friend of mine, Gunnar Lorentzen. He, uh, he was sailing as second mate but he was licensed as master and everything else and uh, he was just a real good friend. I admired his, his work the way he did and uh, one time especially uh, when the master of that ship was unable to sail from La Havre, France due to over overdose of alcohol, uh, Gunner went on up on the bridge and they, nobody could get the captain up so he decided well let's sail. So sailed without incident through the locks and everything out to the uh, English Channel and on home and his reward was he got fired because the captain claimed that he had overstepped his authority and uh, rather than but he was he was an outstanding man I liked I like Gunner although they were young men at the time these radio officers remember very clearly where they were on VJ Day. While we were in uh, India and in Colombo, Ceylon, I had heard a news story about a new weapon had been dropped on Japan. And they called it uh, an atomic bomb. And when we read that, we all laughed at it because we knew there was no such thing, quote unquote, as an atomic bomb. And when the second one was dropped, we thought maybe there's something to it. And of course, the rest is history. I had tuned in in the radio shack, I tuned in the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, listened to the news and heard a news uh, reader saying that uh, President Truman had authorized the dropping of a new weapon, which was now called an atomic bomb and of course, that ended the war. And I was in Colombo, Ceylon uh, when the war ended. VJ Day, I remember very well. We were at anchor uh, on, in Manila Harbor, and it's a huge harbor, a huge bay, and it was full of ships that were uh, preparing for the invasion of Japan. And uh, we were there for probably a month or so and somebody uh, decided that we should move out of Manila and down to Tacloban on Leyte, a Navy base down there. And during that short trip while I was standing watch, 
we received the message that uh, in plain language, which was unusual, the plain language message, uh, the war has ended, Japan has surrendered. And uh, I don't recall if we knew about the about why they had surrendered. Uh, I suppose we did, but I didn't. We didn't really believe in atomic bombs and things like that. But uh, but I can sure remember receiving that message. I kept it for a long time, and and my hand got kind of shaky there at the end as I was typing, as I was writing the message out by hand. So, yeah, that was uh, that was a biggie. After World War II was concluded, the points of radio contact with American ships at sea shifted from naval stations to commercial coastal stations in the United States. Well, during the war, we uh, had radio silence. And most of the coastal stations uh, were off the air or had been taken over by the military. Uh, when the war ended, of course, they returned on the air. And it depended on what kind of equipment one had aboard ship. If one had McKay equipment, then one listened to the McKay radio stations, uh, the biggest one being WSL and Amagansett, Long Island. If one had Radio Marine or RCA equipment, then one listened to WCC, Chatham, Massachusetts. And uh, you, it was all a, a commercial operation. And with the end of the war, there was no more BAMs broadcast, and we, everything reverted back to the commercial idea of things. During the war, the coastal stations that kept us in contact uh, in, uh, in the Atlantic would be WCC or WSL. Uh, in the Pacific, they would be KPH or KFS, the big, big coastal stations. Uh, even when you got, well, when you were going over to North Europe, you would change over to GBR, one of the British stations. Uh, but you would always, you know, and we're talking about during the war, you would always be receiving from, from the Navy stations. After the war, why you could pick and choose whatever station you wanted. Uh, although when you were out in the Indian Ocean and the captain gave you a message for uh, the United States, it was, you kind of felt like you were defeated if you weren't able, able to make contact with a U.S. coastal station. You could use the others and, and it would get through. But I remember many, many nights staying up until two and three o'clock in the morning, pounding the old key there, uh, trying to make contact with WCC. And you'd finally, maybe about three o'clock in the morning, make contact and get rid of your little 10-word message and go on to bed. I did work one year in Chatham, Mass at WCC. And it was a great experience. And I think that's where I really became a sharp and rapid, fast uh, operator. Um, you sit there for eight hours with earphones on. And it's constant traffic handling from all over the world depending on which band you're listening on and the uh, atmospheric conditions and so on. Very busy. Uh, one could eat one's sandwich with one hand and type the messages you were copying with the other hand. A break for the traffic list, uh, but that was it. And at the end of eight hours, uh, your ears were ringing, and you would go home and your ears would ring for a couple of hours afterwards. Very intense, very busy. And I think that experience uh, really turned me into, I, I, I hope you don't think I'm bragging, but a really good operator. After I retired from uh, Merchant Marine, I knew the operator at the WPD in Tampa and so I sat around there with him talking and uh, watching the action and everything just because I miss being out at sea. And uh, so when he retired, another, another uh, fellow took over after him, but he didn't make it. He, uh, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, do the job. 
And the owner of the station called me one day. I, I had known her for a long time. He says, Don, can you get down there right away? Uh, yeah. So I went down to WPD and uh, stayed there for 20 years as uh, uh, manager of the station. And we built it. That, that was a great job. I loved that. Uh, mainly in building it up from a little one-man station with uh, two receivers and one transmitter into a station that could really uh, compete with the biggies. Because when we would, would receive a message, we could get rid of it and, and may have it delivered just as quick as uh, WCC or KPH could. Um, in fact, we were affiliated with RCA and that helped a lot because they would collect our billing uh, from over from foreign ships. We did all the local billing, so that was a that was a real good adventure. They accused me sometimes of just working half a day because there were 24 hours in a day, you know. So I worked 12, and uh, until we finally got some uh, other operators in to help out and uh, give give me a little time off, there wasn't any. But uh, that is where, where you really learn the Morse code. And uh, one of the, one of the <laughs> requirements I found that was necessary in working at a coastal station was being able to copy bad code. Because <laughs> you, you had to get the message right, and what you received in your mind wasn't necessarily what the operator sent. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was an adventure, but I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the experience at the coastal station, and I think that's where I really ha uh, improved all of my operating skills. But there's something about going to sea. Uh, I, I'm afflicted with uh, travel, wanderlust, they call it. And uh, I did return to sea. And just as an aside, after the war was over, I went with the Army Transport Service. And I was aboard uh, uh, the General Hersey, a troop transport. We carried uh, four American nurses. And um, two of them got off in New Orleans. And we had, they were old. They were in their 40s, you know. And uh, <laughs> two uh, new nurses came aboard. They were young. And it's a very long story. We don't have time for it, but I'll make it very short. I married the blonde nurse, and the third mate, who was from my hometown, married the dark-haired nurse. Uh, we both quit, eventually quit going to sea, and I'm happy to say uh, those marriages did last. I'm sad to say uh, both of those girls uh, did die, and we were both widowed. And I have since remarried, of course, uh, but very fond memories of all of that. Comparing working at sea and working at a coastal station is difficult because I, I loved the work at WPD, but I also loved it at sea. Uh, it was a lot more difficult, a lot more stress ashore. But that was one of the nice things of being at sea. You left all that back at back at home or at, uh, you know on on shore. So uh, I I really enjoyed both. That's all I can. Uh, it, it's hard to make a, a determination as to which one I like best. There were different ways, you know, different different things altogether, but were good. <laughs> Well, Morse code is one, one of the oldest ways of communications. Uh, it is still in use, uh, as I understand it today, only by the hams, the amateur radio operators, and some of the military. I don't know what they're doing with it. 
Uh, but Morse code today is, it's, as I say, it's passé, except military and the hands. And it's a skill, it's an art uh, that uh, I feel should be learned uh, for the sake of learning. Morse code, as far as I'm concerned, is my second language. Uh, during the war and, and in peacetime, when, when we were working uh, foreign stations or foreign ships, why, there was, it was not only the Morse code that they had to understand, but th there was a, a system of cue signals uh, that were international. Uh, a radio operator, a radio officer on ship and uh, ashore could pass traffic, whether he was a Chinese operator or a Russian radio operator or an American or what. Because when I would hear uh, QTC, that would mean to me, I have a message for you. Well, it would mean the same thing in Spanish or uh, Italian or, or whatever, uh, Russian or Chinese, to that person. So the Q code, there were enough of the uh, Q signs that you could easily carry on communications and uh, therefore it was, it was definitely a language. There were over 3,200 Liberty and Victory ships that carried the freight for the Allies during World War II, but almost all have vanished from the American scene. Five have survived as museum ships, including the American Victory birthed in downtown Tampa, Florida. Oh, the American Victory is, uh, that's, that's what I do to uh, remind me of what I used to do. <laughs> the American Victory is, uh, uh, a wartime uh, victory ship built in 1944, I believe, and uh, she's been uh, been refurbished and uh, brought to Tampa as a, uh, a museum ship, and has taken many uh, short voyages out to uh, to Egmont Key and uh, and, pa and to the bridge. Uh, on her under her own steam, and uh, uh, several of us on the in the radio department have uh, uh, refurbished the equipment. We use the same uh, equipment that we did uh, back when the ship was operating. That's all been refurbished, mostly by Jim Howell and Tommy Beard. Once a week on Saturday mornings, why or Saturday afternoons, why uh, several of the uh, licensed radio officers that are in the area uh, go down there and, and actually fire off, fire up the equipment and make contact with the station on the west coast near San Francisco that is uh, using the call sign KSM now but actually was KPH way back in, uh, in active days and one of the leading stations in the world. So the, this bunch of people out there have done on a larger scale what we've done here and uh, yeah, make, it, make it worthwhile to go down there and, and actually fire up the stuff and use the old Morse code there and, uh, and make contact using our license because they still require a radio operator with, a, with at least a second class radio telegraph license. Uh, to operate in those commercial bands. Uh, you can, we also have a ham station down there that's W4AVM that uh, really uh, does a, has, has a fine looking station. We have been given a room there on board the ship just on the same deck with the ship's radio room that uh, they've, uh, the group of, of hams have uh, set up a great uh, uh, a, a real radio, a ham radio station there that's uh, that's active. So, so American Victory is a, they they do have daytime tours. People can come down and uh, and walk aboard, and it's a self-guided tour. They're able to go from one end of the vessel to the other and see how it really was back then. And uh, it's she's still has her, her, some of her armament on board. That's interesting. Uh, several of, uh, of Eagle Scouts have made uh, 
projects down there of, of helping to clean up the, uh, the ship and get things back in operation. They cleaned one of my Eagle Scouts, uh, cleaned up the, uh, the five inch uh, gun on the stern and got it looking great, but they wouldn't give us a bullet. 